I'm quite certain that the navigators and the over the great deserts are the navigators of the sea who did deal in the stars as the only way to give them information about where they are. Got, probably developed the first trigonometry and the first important geometrical calculations. Did then, <coughs> from time to time, lose their abacus overboard on the ship or in the, lost in the sands. But being so familiar with it, they could draw a picture of it. They could see it in their mind's eye very nicely. And they could then manipulate the concept of filling up that column and then moving over one. I'm quite certain that the Arabic numerals represented a symbol for the content of the column. And when they moved over and left an empty column, they had to have the cipher. So the, the Arab numerals, Arab, Arabic numerals had the cipher. It's interesting then that the Arabic numerals were first taken over in the Mediterranean world as substitutes for the Roman numerals. The to him and so many bags of wheat to him, but you left bags of wheat and uh, the bags of wheat and sheep bound back of the church. So that there was a very large take on the part of the temporal power by, by virtue of controlling the calculation. As a consequence with the publication of this book explaining the <coughs> way in which you position numbers the literacy was, was, was rampant, so not too many people could read it. But it became a, very much a threat <coughs> that anybody could do their own calculation, not have to go to the authorities to do the calculation for them. So that in many, many of those little kingdoms throughout the, the Mediterranean world, it became a death penalty if anybody caught using the cipher. The word cipher becomes, has a secret connotation for this reason. Because people use it, they needed to use it. The attempt, I've got to do my own calculation, but if I get caught, I'm, I'm, so I must be very secretive with it. The, gradually, the significance of the cipher permeates society, particularly the young student world that was literate. So the students of northern Italy and southern Germany began to realize more and more the significance of that cipher, and the positioning numbers do their own calculations. So <coughs> they. Young people's faces are less familiar than the older people's faces, so the young people could get away with what the older people can't. So, with approximately 500, see, we go, that was, it was 1200, 500 years after the Arabic numerals come into the Mediterranean world that the treatise is written, that's 1200, and 300 years later, the, it is impossible to ever again enforce the prohibition against use of the cipher. And this is a wonderful date, 500, we're talking about 1500, 500 years ago. And this is exactly when Copernicus comes in. It was a Copernicus suddenly with the cap capability to calculate. <laughs> and calculating the positions and, and some of the interrelationships of these, of what we call those planets, he came to the conclusion that our Earth was also a planet <laughs> and behaving in relation to the Sun the way the other planets were. This opened up a completely new excitation of humanity. Remember now I'm saying, his brain getting all this special case business, and mind intuitively stimulated that there must be something going on here. I'd like to find out what it is that is going on. And suddenly we have this calculating capability, and Copernicus coming out with a very new, fantastically new idea that we were not standing still with all this show going around us, but that we were one of the planets of that sun. And we have then Tycho Brahe, very inspired by, by, by Copernicus and man of great means and acquired instruments for much better observation. And he had his, his great observer who was, was Kepler. And, and Kepler then made extraordinary new, much more accurate observations of the planets and began to be able then to say considerable. First place he discovered they were moving in ellipses and not in, in circular orbits. If you yourself have ever made an experiment of just drawing a circle, having a pen and a string and a pencil, you know that you have a single restraint. But if you want to make an ellipse, you have two restraints. So the fact that they were moving in ellipses indicated that there was not only some relationship to the sun, but to some other, possibly some integrated 
effect of the other of the other uh, of the other planets. And <coughs> Kepler then now had beautiful data which showed that they were a team, all right. They're all going around the sun, but <coughs> they were different sizes. They were different distances from the sun. They all went around the sun at different rates. So the the team was a very disorderly team. And yet he felt that the fact that they were all on one team, they, they must have something more about them. But now that he had his calculating capability, he then did what a mathematician can do. He said, I'm going to take, I want to find something common to these. I can't, superficially, there's nothing common to them. They're all different. But I'm going to give them an amount of time very much less than one orbit of the, of the fastest orbiting. So I think, as I remember, the amount of time was 21 days. And now he knew how far they were from the sun, each one. So on the beginning of that 21 days, he's here, and then he knows exactly the amount of arc in 21 days. Then he has the radius from the end of that arc back to the sun again. Makes a piece of pie shape area. He found the same 21 days. Some of them were short, fat pie, and some were long, thin pie. But because he had the actual mathematical data, he was then able to calculate the areas of the piece of pie. Extraordinary intuition it must have made him do such a thing. It must have said, as long as I have the data, I might as well calculate it. And to his absolute astonishment, he found the areas were all exactly the same in this given amount of time. So while there was superficial difference, I, I, I want you to try to think of yourself being the first human being I mean, all this stimulation has gone on for thousands of years. They suddenly realize that hidden in this superficial disorder was the most incredible, elegant mathematical order. Absolute coordination. And he would have to reason that if they were touching each other, you could understand how gears could coordinate. But the incredible distance is intervening. How could they possibly coordinate with this elegant mathematical manner? But one thing you could say about the, that was that they were these great distances apart, and he knew that if he had a string on, a weight on a string and swung it around his head, it was in an orbit. If he let go, it seemed to go off in a line. The fact that they were in orbits indicated there was some kind of a tensive restraint. So he really got down to that. There's a tensive restraint, and it could be that the other planets got in various positions where there was a, there was a composite of their, of their, their poles to affect, bring about this elliptical phenomenon. We have Galileo, like other brains then, terribly stimulated by experiences, but suddenly with calculating capability. So he began to measure the rates at which objects would go down inclined planes of different angles and free-falling bodies. And he found these free-falling bodies <coughs> were increasing in their rate of falling. There was an acceleration. And he found the rate at which they were accelerating was actually multiplying the number times itself to the second power rate of acceleration. We have then Isaac Newton, enormously stimulated by all the, all the foregoing events of all these other discoverers. And he himself also then with mathematical capability. And he, he, and he had a deep drive to somehow understand that tensive relationship Kepler had discovered. And he, he himself then, like you and I, could swing a weight around his head, and every time he let go off like that, then the, he sent off a line like that, but the Earth pulled on it and pulled it that way. Quite clearly, the Earth was much more powerful than he was in sending it this way. Isaac Newton then involved his first law of motion. The body would persist in a straight line except as affected by other bodies. And he said, I see this other body, the Earth, is very, very powerful. It's something to do, how much they pull must have something to do with their sizes. And uh, he then said, I am informed by the astronomers and the navigators. The, we have very good information regarding the interrelationships of the moon and the Earth, the tides, the three quarters of the Earth that covers the water, how those waters are pulled between by the moon, so that trillions of tons of water being lifted by the moon pull 
obviously a pull between them is something vastly greater than my muscles are involved, so it's something to do with size here. Then Isaac Newton, having evolved his first law of motion in the body, but, but persists in a straight line, except it's affected by other bodies. He then conceived hypothetically uh, which a mathematician can do with his, he has his calculating capability. The patterns of the heavens were very well charted by now for the, by the astronomers and the navigators. And for any given minute of any, any night of the year, you knew exactly what the patterns would be, what would be in, in zenith over any given point. That's how you can navigate. So Isaac Newton had some very reliable patterns of the heavens to go by for a given time. So he chose a night when the moon would be in the fall easy to observe and probably clear clear weather. And then he made an assumption that the Earth would be suddenly stop pulling on the moon. As in effect, he doesn't use his words that you would annihilate the Earth for as just you have that weight and swing around your hand, if you let go of it, it goes off this line. So he said, if the Earth suddenly stopped pulling on the moon, it, the moon would go off on a given line. So he calculated what that line would be on that night at that time. And he was able then to pattern it against the heavens. A clearly, a clearly patternable line. Therefore, on that night, at that time, he then measured the rate at which the moon was falling away from that line towards the Earth. And he found the rate which was falling would exactly agree to Galileo's rate of falling bodies, that is, it was, it was an accelerating rate and moving apparently the second power as multiplying the number times itself. Therefore, he said, number one, we will multiply the two masses times each other to get the relative amount of in, interpol compared to between any other two objects. And we halve the distance between the two, we'll increase the interattractiveness fourfold, that is, the second power. He spoke about. He spoke about how it's been in the inverse ratio because he spoke about going away. So if you go f twice as far away, it's only one quarter of the pull. So he had the inverse ratio of the second power of the relative proximity. There were relatively very f few literate people in his day. Very few people really listened to what, what he was saying. But the other astronomers did pay attention. They began then to apply his hypothetical relationship two other astronomical phenomena gradually began to discover, always in, uh, explained all the astronomical interbehaviors of these, these remote bodies. So we have then suddenly human mind, all these various minds of the generations, the many generations, stimulated by something going on there between that's not of, wasn't in any one of those planets by itself at all. And we have then Isaac Newton finding this interrelationship which has proved to be absolutely valid and, and holds, as we even get in the microcosm long after when Isaac Newton didn't know we were going to get in there at all, there's no electromagnetics involved. This mass interattractiveness is, is operative. Isaac Newton was able to say that these two apples wouldn't pull towards each other. Therefore, you and I on the planet would not tend to think about this interpull because the, the pull of the Earth is so enormous as the friction of the apples on the table complete, prevent any demonstration of any local two bodies pulling towards each other. So one reason to escape man for so long had to be these free, free bodies, a great remove that would have to stimulate man to think this way. Now, what I'm coming to then is that there was nothing in the moon in its geometrical dimensions, there was nothing in its chemistry, there was nothing in its electromagnetics, that anyway said it was going to attract the Earth. There was nothing the Earth had said the same. It was not until you saw the inner behavior being manifested in free space that you realized something was going on between. Now this is when, what I said, mind and mind alone has been able to discover relationships that are existing between that are not of any of the special case phenomena. And brain is always dealing in special case. So brains are dealing in special case and mind is dealing in discovering relationships existing between. This is then comes to a word synergy. Synergy means behaviors of whole systems, and a minimum system would be two. <laughs> behaviors of whole systems are predicted by behavior of any of the parts of the system when those parts are considered separately, one from the other. And the word synergy I found going around the world, speaking to 
I've, I've spoken to 500, a little more than 500 colleges and universities around the world. The first 300, I checked my audiences, asking how many familiar with the word synergy, and less than 3%, and popular audiences about 1%. So it became evident to me the word synergy was not popular, but is the only word that means behavior of a whole system unpredicted by behavior of any of the parts considered only separately. The fact then that the great inner behaviors, in fact, all great generalized principles discovered by science are the our relationships existing between that are not of the parts themselves. That's why these scientific discoveries are few and far apart, because they are, you're always just finding relationships. And these relationships can only and are always be expressed mathematically. They're completely generalizable mathematically. So I find that in the universe is quite clearly the, these important generalized principles which we discover a, a generalized principle in science is one which no exception has ever been found to the, to, the, to the mathematics of the principle. And a generalized principle then, you, you, our brains uh, are always dealing in spe each special case, and each special case is inherently terminal, <laughs> finite, <laughs> syntropic, physical. <laughs> Therefore, brain wants to have things begin and end, and brain would like to have a beginning and an end of the universe, a beginning and end of, of, of the world. But mind then discovers principles which are, must have no exception, which means that they're inherently eternal, and not the kind of word that brain is familiar with. <laughs> but it's implicit that they are eternal. They must have never any exception. We find then plurality of these eternal generalized principles operative. And if you become then preoccupied with the family of known generalized principles, then you become deeply impressed to realize that these being eternal, they're all concurrently operative, and none of them has ever been found to contradict any of the others. In fact, they're all found to be inter-accommodative. Now, they all have absolute regularities, and the regularities are inter-accommodative. When you and I use the word design, we use it to mean a complex in which the, inter the various components are ordered in respect to the one with the other. That's a design in contradiction to randomness. There's a deliberate, deliberate placement and ordering. So I'd say then, human mind is gradually discovering, if you're looking at a plurality of the generalized principles, a great a priori design of universe. The, and that human mind has access to the rules and the, the design of the universe, a little glimpse of it, because we keep pulling the curtain upside, realize we, there's a lot more that we don't know. <laughs> but it's most impressive really about this whole experience I just gave you over an Isaac Newton or, or, or Kepler, is that he asked Mr. Newton what the gravity is, he's able to tell you how it behaves. I, said, I can't possibly tell you what it is because there's nothing in any, any data, any, any special case you point to. It says it's going to happen, absolutely nothing. Therefore, when you come to the great moments, the actual fact of how great generalized principles are discovered, you come to a priori absolute mystery, within which a priori a, a absolute mystery, this most sublime and reliable relationship is, is manifest as existing. So the, 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 uh, to me, the, the, the more intimate you become with the actual working moments of those who made the great discoveries, the more deeply moved you are by an a priori great mystery. I'm, I'm going to uh, have, a, have a break for a little while. I think that it's, it's quite hot inside here and, and everybody's getting a, a fairly, fairly affected by, by the heat. So let, let's have a little air.